Well, hello, everyone. So I think probably most people are familiar with a lot of the architecture extension specs that RISC V uh, develops. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about profile specs and platform specs and how that fits into a bigger picture of uh, the various uh, standardization efforts that uh, RISC V International is uh, you know, developing. First, for just a little bit of context, that uh, RISC-V architecture itself is a very highly modular, extensible architecture. That's some of its strengths. Uh, there are three base ISAs, you know, uh, two 32-bit ones called R32E and I, and also then the 64-bit I base architecture. And then on top of that, you have a lot of optional add-on ISA extensions. And that provides a lot of flexibility so that an implementer targeting maybe certain applications or workloads can you know, uh, choose the extensions that matter to them, that they want to bear the burden of developing, paying the cost of, and so on, but that you know, meets their needs, and not being burdened with all these other things. Uh, there's also that flexibility to extend the ISO with custom extensions. Uh, that all sounds great. The problem is that that's a recipe for uh, fragmentation within the uh, ecosystem, both the hardware and the software ecosystem. You know, there's an infinite number of combinations of ICE extensions. This implementation is supporting these 10, that one's supporting those 15, and how, how is software going to deal with all that? And so that's where uh, ISA profiles and uh, platform specs come into the picture. I'll primarily today be talking about uh, uh, the ISA profiles and a little bit about platforms, and then I'll point you all to another presentation tomorrow that will focus primarily on uh, what platform specs are all about. Uh, one thing to be clear is with the ISA profile specs is they're just focused around ISA standardization in contrast to the platform specs you know, are taking a further kind of broader uh, approach to more of a system level approach where you're standardizing both ISA and other non-ISA parts of hardware, software, APIs, et cetera. All the things that matter more to putting together RISC-V based systems. Um, and so uh, leading up to uh, the summit this year, over the, through this year has been a lot of architecture extensions that have uh, gotten across the goal line and been ratified uh, on top of the ones you know, that we've had for you know, a, a couple of plus years. And uh, uh, coming soon is going to be profile specs that builds upon, uh, built on top of that. Um, in general, the idea is uh, there will be a, a yearly cadence for uh, ISA profiles. And for a given, like say for the 2022 ISA profiles, uh, they're all based on what has been ratified up until uh, the end of 2021, the year before the year of the profile. And uh, at least for what will be the 2020, kind of backward looking, and then 2022 profiles, uh, those will be released uh, by, by early spring of this year in terms of final approved ratified form. Going forward, the intention, though, is for the profiles to be a little more kind of proactive or forward-looking, which means they need to be established a bit sooner, uh, at the latest, by the end of the, of the uh, year before the year of that profile. So the 2023 profiles, work is already going to be starting work soon on those to have those nailed down by, you know, uh, towards the end of 2022. Um, <clears throat> and the ISO profiles are essentially defining hardware and software support requirements for compatible implementations. If software is going to be compatible you know, with this profile, if hardware is going to be compatible with this profile, what does that mean? What are the uh, requirements uh, being placed on hardware and software? Uh, ISO profiles will also be a basis for uh, branding. When someone wants to claim that they are recite compatible with maybe a given profile or a given platform. Uh, a little more just kind of base context here that there will actually be three profile families. Over time, there might even be more, but at least we're starting with three. The first is really just a very basic, almost legacy kind of thing, which is the RVI family of profiles, which are really the lowest common denominator profiles, lowest common denominator profile, based on RVI, RV32i, RV64i. And they're really primarily just for branding purposes for people that uh, want to at least claim compatibility with that, 
um, and then they may have whatever other optional things they add on. Uh, the more notable uh, profiles are the RVM and the RVA profiles, where you know the M and EA kind of represents sort of microcontroller uh, you know realm of, uh, of designs. Generally, these are cost sensitive designs, very application optimized, embedded designs running a bare metal or a simple RCOS uh, execution environment. And in general, you know across that embedded space. Uh, People are doing very different things. There needs to be a lot of flexibility in uh, the RVM profile correspondingly um, versus setting a very high bar of, of everyone must do these 20 things. There are you know, a certain set of mandatory requirements and then there'll be a lot of optionality to accommodate that range of uh, designs that would like to be RVM profile compliant. Now the uh, RVA profile family you know, sets a somewhat higher bar. It's also more oriented towards application uh, class uh, environments, in other words, Linux class, and other higher end and mid range embedded designs that are running a quote, rich OS execution environment, typically Linux, but it doesn't have to be that. Uh, and generally, you know, uh, those kind of systems have more sophisticated ISA needs. Um, there's always a balance to be struck between having more and more standardization, setting a higher bar, uh, which imposes more requirements. And then on the other hand, you're also putting more burdens on all hardware implementations. And so there's always a balance to be struck in the case of the RVM profiles. Uh, the bar is set relatively low to provide a lot of flexibility, whereas the RVA profile uh, uh, does set you know, kind of a moderate bar, but still a fair amount of optionality. Uh, but it's really trying to strike a, a, a good balance for the application class processors where there is you know, a, a higher base that is kind of guaranteed for our for all RVA profile um, compliant designs. And a part of the point of all of this uh, also, or one of the benefits is to uh, establish a convenient target for tool chains and OS distributions. That you can, you know, instead of having all these, you know, compile flags for the different extensions and so on, you know, if you just have a flag for RVA, that then implies a whole bunch of things. Uh, or similarly, that uh, uh, maybe, uh, OS distros may choose to uh, basically uh, targeting a pile of all their software for the RVA profile. So it kind of uh, creates a sort of a basis of commonality for everyone to be you know, kind of targeting in the software ecosystem. So just to give a little bit more detailed sense of how each of the families breaks down, um, that and you can see if I take on the left half is the 2020 profiles. Uh, both the RVI 20 and then RVM and RVA 20 profiles. In general, uh, within those, and say if we just take the RVA profiles as an example. In general, uh, there, there are separate um, profiles within that family, uh, corresponding to each of the privilege levels, machine level functionality, supervisor level functionality, and user level uh, functionality. And then there's also you know, is this, uh, the matter of is this based on RV32i or RV64i? You know, the 32-bit or 64-bit architectures. Uh, in the case of RVM, you have both uh, flavors uh, there as well, whereas to start with, the RVA profiles are all 64-bit based. Uh, that may change in the future, but at least in terms of the near-term needs of what people would like, you, know, you can see reflected here. And then a uh, similar structure for the uh, 2022 profiles, which is where it'll probably get more interesting in terms of all the actual details that uh, will be uh, starting into a public review process over the next you know, few months. And then uh, within a given profile, what it's doing to start with is establishing uh, five categories. And you're going to take for this profile, say for a 2022 profile, uh, Here's all the uh, extensions that have been ratified uh, before 2022, and they'll all get categorized that for this profile, which of those extensions are mandatory, which ones are supported optional, unsupported optional, et cetera. I'll kind of walk through each of these. So the mandatory is probably the most obvious, that that's saying that hardware that's going to be compliant with this profile must implement those mandatory extensions. Similarly, software must support those extensions. A supported optional is again, well, is on the one hand now saying, hey, it's optional for hardware uh, implementers. Software must still support it if it is there. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, in a minute I'll talk about what does software support really mean. But uh, in any case, uh, those are the two probably most notable categories. Unsupported optional is gonna be for the uncommon extension that 
you know, uh, practically speaking, is, is a relatively niche and uh, not necessarily something that uh, RVI through the profiles wants to mandate that software must support those. Sure, those architecture extensions, people are free to come along and say, hey, I really care about this, now I'm going to develop the software to meet my needs. But in terms of as a profile for more general use, um, most extensions will fall in the first two categories. There will be a few in that unsupported optional category. Uh, so you're not putting an imposition on either hardware or software to support those. Uh, based on the extensions that are within the profile, there may be certain uh, risk of architecture extensions that are just flat out incompatible. Um, for example, uh, some of like the, the Z, uh, FNX, floating point and integer registers extensions, um, you know, uh, are incompatible with certain other you know, floating point related extensions. Uh, and they're really suited for some, you know, the latter more for embedded oriented designs, the other for a wide range, wide range of other designs. And then, of course, the um, not applicable is, for example, you know, um, uh, extensions that weren't uh, yet ratified and so not really relevant. Now, as far as the question of what does software support mean when you say software uh, must support an extension, uh, that will vary from extension to extension. Uh, in general, and, and the, the basic statement or requirement is that the profile is saying that there must be basic tool chain support. Uh, assembler, linker, uh, compiler, et cetera, uh, just the, the basics there, so that then, in a sense, that's the easy part, relatively speaking, but that then is, uh, provides the foundation for the much larger mass of software developers uh, to come along and to then develop the actual software that takes advantage of a given architecture extension, and then further takes advantage of it in a very optimized way. Um, and so, uh, through the profile, it is at least establishing that you know, kind of software base, you know, in terms of tool chain support that can then enable all this other software development uh, to come along. Uh, and of course, ultimately, you know, kind of full use of all the architecture extensions and optimized use is, you know, is the end goal, but, you know, the profile isn't trying to mandate all of that all, all at once. Mm -hmm. And then past this categorization of a profile saying, here's the mandatory extensions, here's the supported optional, you know, et cetera, that uh, a profile can also choose to uh, mandate further detailed requirements. Uh, and this most commonly arises with the uh, privilege architecture spec itself, what some would call like priv 1.11 or priv 1.12. <laughs> and um, uh, that uh, within the privilege architecture, uh, there's a lot of optionality, a lot of also what are called WARL fields that, uh, again, allow a lot of implementation or hardware flexibility, uh, as well as do you even support this particular feature within the PRIV architecture. And uh, uh, so again, there's lots of flexibility, and the profile, in some cases, wants to constrain that down by either maybe requiring certain optional features actually be supported uh, in a profile-compliant uh, design. Uh, similarly, that uh, with fields that you know, uh, maybe our, our WARL fields or otherwise provide lots of, you know, options for what are allowed values is, you know, a profile may choose to constrain or mandate some of those as well. Uh, and still leave a lot of other things flexible, but, you know, um, and profiles will vary in terms of how far they go or don't go in this regard. But uh, the point is that, say, an, ar an architecture extension itself uh, tends to provide, especially on the privileged architecture side, tends to provide a lot of optionality and flexibility. Profiles can come along and constrain that for, for uh, within uh, a given profile and its intended you know, uh, audience. And, uh, and one last example of this is that uh, some ICE extensions that contain CSRs that the register must always be there, but it's allowed to just be hardware at zero and doesn't really provide any useful purpose. There is a defined useful purpose for it, it's just not required to be implemented. And so again, a profile may want to come along and say, hey, you know, for these certain CSRs, it really must be properly implemented and actually must provide the intended information that software can use. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, platforms. Uh, and then you know, at the bottom of the slide, you can see I make reference to a presentation tomorrow uh, morning that will focus more on, on platforms and what they're about, the what and the why. Um, but just to give a, a general sense, you know, platforms 
are trying to establish standardization as well uh, at sort of a broader system level. And hence, they're, they're not just about hardware architecture specs, but also non-ISO specs and, and software and APIs, et cetera, like I mentioned before. And the, the motivation is to reduce ecosystem fragmentation. Uh, and this is with respect to you know, specific hardware uh, uh, targets. Uh, <clears throat> and on the one hand, that's giving guidance to the hardware and system implementers in terms of what, what they should be planning on implementing. Because out of all this flexibility in the architecture and even in the profiles, that uh, uh, everyone's left to make their own choices for their target market and so on. But, you know, and again, if I skip down to the second bullet, that there will be platform specs targeting different broad application areas, such as microcontroller slash embedded applications, again, more kind of like your RVM profile type of designs, uh, server, HPC, Android, automotive, you know, et cetera. And, uh, and so within each of those target areas, which is much more targeted than, say, a profile, which is more targeted than just this menu of architecture extensions, that um, a given platform spec focuses in a certain area that's still you know, not narrow, but uh, certainly a lot narrower than you know, uh, the whole spectrum. And it's trying to introduce more standardization so that you can have hardware that's platform compliant, software that's platform compliant, by those, you know, you're maybe a system developer, you just get those two things, put them together, they work together. Uh, you don't have to go do lots of X or work to get them all you know, to play well together. Uh, and so that's you know, sort of the whole interoperability thing, is get your hardware from wherever, your software from wherever, you know, maybe it's distro, download it, boot, off you go. Um, that's the goal. Um, and as I you know, mentioned that you know, platforms are really touching both on the hardware and the software side, APIs both between hardware and software and different layers of software. In general, platform specs themselves are not developing new standards, new extensions. Uh, they instead reference RISC-V architecture extensions, RISC-V profiles. Uh, they also may reference uh, industry standards, say with, really with a device tree, ACPI, and you know, many other things. Uh, and generally, a uh, platform will also choose to be, uh, you know, uh, it will mandate or require a certain uh, ISO profile. Uh, so for example, the OSA platform specs that you can hear about tomorrow, which are more Linux class uh, designs, will in fact you know, be based on the RVA uh, profiles. And um, I think I am done. Good enough. Thank you.